Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoy this binaural beats audiobook. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more great videos. We'd be delighted if you loved this video so much you liked it and shared it with a friend. Section 9 of Frankenstein. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Frankenstein, or the Modern Prometheus, by Mary Shelley. Section 9. Chapter 7. On my return, I found the following letter from my father. My dear Victor, you have probably waited impatiently for a letter to fix the date of your return to us, and I was at first tempted to write only a few lines, merely mentioning the day on which I should expect you. But that would be a cruel kindness, and I dare not do it. What would be your surprise, my son, when you expected a happy and glad welcome, to behold, on the contrary, tears and wretchedness? And how, Victor, can I relate our misfortune? Absence cannot have rendered you callous to our joys and griefs, and how shall I inflict pain on my long-absent son? I wish to prepare you for the woeful news, but I know it is impossible. Even now your eye skims over the page to seek the words which are to convey to you the horrible tidings. William is dead. That sweet child, whose smiles delighted and warmed my heart, who was so gentle, yet so gay. Victor, he is murdered. I will not attempt to console you, but will simply relate the circumstances of the transaction. Last Thursday, May 7th, I, my niece, and your two brothers went to walk in Plain Palace. The evening was warm and serene, and we prolonged our walk further than usual. It was already dusk before we thought of returning, and then we discovered that William and Ernst, who had gone on before, were not to be found. We accordingly rested on a seat till they should return. Presently Ernst came, and inquired if we had seen his brother. He said that he had been playing with him, that William had run away to hide himself, and that he had vainly sought for him, and afterwards waited for a long time, but that he did not return. This account rather alarmed us, and we continued to search for him until night fell, when Elizabeth conjectured that he might have returned to the house. He was not there. We returned again with torches, for I could not rest, when I thought that my sweet boy had lost himself, and was exposed to all the damps and dews of night. Elizabeth also suffered extreme anguish. About five in the morning, I discovered my lovely boy, whom the night before I had seen blooming and active in health, stretched on the grass, livid and motionless. The print of the murderer's finger was on his neck. He was conveyed home, and the anguish that was visible in my countenance betrayed the secret to Elizabeth. She was very earnest to see the corpse. At first I attempted to prevent her, but she persisted, and entering the room where it lay, hastily examined the neck of the victim, and clasping her hands, exclaimed, Oh, God! I have murdered my darling child! She fainted, and was restored with extreme difficulty. When she again lived, it was only to weep and sigh. She told me that that same evening William had teased her to let him wear a very valuable miniature that she possessed of your mother. This picture is gone, and was doubtless a temptation which urged the murderer to the deed. We have no trace of him at present, though our exertions to discover him are unremitted. But they will not restore my beloved William. Come, dearest Victor, you alone can console Elizabeth. She weeps continually, and accuses herself unjustly as the cause of his death. Her words pierce my heart. We are all unhappy, but will not be that an additional motive for you, my son, to return and be our comforter? Your dear mother, alas, Victor, I now say, thank God she did not live to witness the cruel, miserable death of her youngest darling. Come, Victor, not brooding thoughts of vengeance against the assassin, but with feelings of peace and gentleness, that will heal, instead of festering, the wounds of our minds. Enter the house of mourning, my friend, but with kindness and affection for those who love you, and not with hatred for your enemies. Your affectionate and afflicted father, Alphonse Frankenstein. Geneva, May 12th, 17- Clerval, who had watched my countenance as I read this letter, was surprised to observe the despair that succeeded the joy I had first expressed on receiving news from my friends. I threw the letter on the table and covered my face with my hands. My dear Frankenstein, exclaimed Henry when he perceived me weep with bitterness. Are you always to be unhappy? My dear friend, what has happened? I motioned him to take up the letter, while I walked up and down the room in the extremest agitation. Tears also gushed from the eyes of Clerval, as he read the account of my misfortune. 
I can offer you no consolation, my friend, said he. Your disaster is irreparable. What do you intend to do? To go instantly to Geneva. Come with me, Henry, to order the horses. During our walk, Clerval endeavoured to say a few words of consolation. He could only express his heartfelt sympathy. Poor William, said he. Dear, lovely child, he now sleeps with his angel mother. Who that had seen him bright and joyous in his young beauty, but must weep over his untimely loss? To die so miserably, to feel the murderer's grasp. How much more a murder that could destroy radiant innocence. Poor young fellow, one only consolation have we. His friends mourn and weep, but he is at rest. The pang is over, his sufferings are at an end for ever. A sod covers his gentle form, and he knows no pain. He can no longer be a subject for pity. We must reserve that for his miserable survivors. Clerval spoke thus as we hurried through the streets. The words impressed themselves on my mind, and I remembered them afterwards in solitude. But now, as soon as the horses arrived, I hurried into the cabriolet and bade farewell to my friend. My journey was very melancholy. At first I wished to hurry on, for I longed to console and sympathize with my loved and sorrowing friends. But when I drew near my native town, I slackened my progress. I could hardly sustain the multitude of feelings that crowded into my mind. I passed through scenes familiar to my youth, but which I had not seen for nearly six years. How altered everything might be during that time! One sudden and desolating change had taken place, but a thousand little circumstances might have by degrees worked other alterations, which, although they were done more tranquilly, might not be the less decisive. Fear overcame me. I dared no advance, dreading a thousand nameless evils that made me tremble, although I was unable to define them. I remained two days at Lausanne in this painful state of mind. I contemplated the lake. The waters were placid, all around was calm, and the snowy mountains, the palaces of nature, were not changed. By degrees the calm and heavenly scene restored me, and I continued my journey towards Geneva. The road ran by the side of the lake which became narrower as I approached my native town. I discovered more distinctly the black sides of Jura and the bright summit of Mont Blanc. I wept like a child. Dear mountains, my own beautiful lake, how do you welcome your wanderer? Your summits are clear, the sky and lake are blue and placid. Is this to prognosticate peace or to mock at my unhappiness? I fear, my friend, that I shall render myself tedious by dwelling on these preliminary circumstances. But they are days of comparative happiness, and I think of them with pleasure. My country, my beloved country, who but a native can tell the delight I took in again beholding thy streams, thy mountains, and more than all, thy lovely lake? Yet, as I drew nearer home, grief and fear again overcame me. Night also closed around, and when I could hardly see the dark mountains, I felt still more gloomily. The picture appeared a vast and dim scene of evil, and I foresaw obscurely that I was destined to become the most wretched of human beings. Alas, I prophesied truly and failed only in one single circumstance, that in all the misery I imagined and dreaded, I did not conceive the hundredth part of the anguish I was destined to endure. It was completely dark when I arrived in the environs of Geneva. The gates of the town were already shut, and I was obliged to pass the night at Secheron, a village at the distance of half a league from the city. The sky was serene, and, as I was unable to rest, I resolved to visit the spot where my poor William had been murdered. 
As I could not pass through the town, I was obliged to cross the lake in a boat to arrive at Plain Palais. During this short voyage I saw the lightning playing on the summit of Mont Blanc in the most beautiful figures. The storm appeared to approach rapidly, and on landing I ascended a low hill that I might observe its progress. It advanced. The heavens were clouded, and I soon felt the rain coming slowly in large drops, but its violence quickly increased. I quitted my seat and walked on, although the darkness and storm increased every minute, and the thunder burst with a terrific crash over my head. It was echoed from Salev, the Juras, and the Alps of Savoy. Vivid flashes of lightning dazzled my eyes, illuminating the lake, making it appear like a vast sheet of fire. Then, for an instant, everything seemed of a pitchy darkness, until the eye recovered itself from the preceding flash. The storm, as is often the case in Switzerland, appeared at once in various parts of the heavens. The most violent storm hung exactly north of the town, over the part of the lake which lies between the promontory of Belrive and the village of Copay. Another storm enlightened Jura with faint flashes, and another darkened and sometimes disclosed the Mole, a peaked mountain to the east of the lake. While I watched the tempest, so beautiful yet terrific, I wandered on with a hasty step. This noble war in the sky elevated my spirits. I clasped my hands and exclaimed aloud, William, dear angel, this is thy funeral, this thy dirge. As I said these words, I perceived in the gloom a figure which stole from behind a clump of trees near me. I stood fixed, gazing intently. I could not be mistaken. A flash of lightning illuminated the object, and discovered its shape plainly to me. Its gigantic stature, and the deformity of its aspects more hideous than belongs to humanity, instantly informed me that it was the wretch, the filthy demon, to whom I had given life. What did he there? Could he be, I shuddered at the conception, the murderer of my brother? No sooner did that idea cross my imagination than I became convinced of its truth. My teeth chattered, and I was forced to lean against a tree for support. The figure passed me quickly, and I lost it in the gloom. Nothing in human shape could have destroyed the fair child. He was the murderer. I could not doubt it. The mere presence of the idea was an irresistible proof of the fact. I thought of pursuing the devil, but it would have been in vain, for another flash discovered him to me hanging among the rocks of the nearly perpendicular ascent of Montsalève, a hill that bounds Plain Palais on the south. He soon reached the summit and disappeared. I remained motionless. The thunder ceased, but the rain still continued, and the scene was enveloped in an impenetrable darkness. I revolved in my mind the events which I had until now sought to forget, the whole train of my progress toward the creation, the appearance of the works of my own hands at my bedside, its departure. Two years had now nearly elapsed since the night on which he first received life, and was this his first crime? Alas, I had turned loose into the world a depraved wretch, whose delight was in carnage and misery. Had he not murdered my brother? No one can conceive the anguish I suffered during the remainder of the night, which I spent cold and wet in the open air. But I did not feel the inconvenience of the weather. My imagination was busy in scenes of evil and despair. I considered the being whom I had cast among mankind, and endowed with the will and power to effect purposes of horror, such as the deed which he had now done, nearly in the light of my own vampire, my own spirit let loose from the grave, 
and forced to destroy all that was dear to me. Day dawned, and I directed my steps toward the town. The gates were open, and I hastened to my father's house. My first thought was to discover what I knew of the murderer, and cause instant pursuit to be made. But I paused when I reflected on the story that I had to tell. A being whom I myself had formed and endued with life had met me at midnight among the precipices of an inaccessible mountain. I remembered also the nervous fever with which I had been seized just at the time I dated my creation and which would give an air of delirium to a tale otherwise so utterly improbable. I well knew that if any other had communicated such a relation to me, I should have looked upon it as the ravings of insanity. Besides, the strange nature of the animal would elude all pursuit, even if I were so far credited as to persuade my relatives to commence it. And then, of what use would be pursuit? Who could arrest a creature capable of scaling the overhanging sides of Mont Salève? These reflections determined me, and I resolved to remain silent. It was about five in the morning when I entered my father's house. I told the servants not to disturb the family, and went into the library to attend their usual hour of rising. Six years had elapsed passed in a dream but for one inedible trace, and I stood in the same place where I had last embraced my father before my departure for Ingolstadt. Beloved and venerable parent he still remained to me. I gazed on the picture of my mother which stood over the mantelpiece. It was an historical subject, painted at my father's desire, and represented Caroline Beaufort in an agony of despair, kneeling by the coffin of her dead father. Her garb was rustic, and her cheek pale, but there was an air of dignity and beauty that hardly permitted the sentiments of pity. Below this picture was a miniature of William, and my tears flowed when I looked upon it. While I was thus engaged, Ernest answered, he had heard me arrive, and hastened to welcome me. "'Welcome, my dearest Victor,' said he. "'Oh, I wish it had come three months ago, and then you would have found us all joyous and delighted. You come to us now to share a misery which nothing can alleviate. Yet your presence will, I hope, revive our father, who seems sinking under his misfortune, and your persuasions will induce poor Elizabeth to seize her vain and tormenting self-accusations. Poor William, he was our darling and our pride. Tears, unrestrained, fell from my brother's eyes. A sense of mortal agony crept over my frame. Before I had only imagined the wretchedness of my desolated home. The reality came on me as a new and a not less terrible disaster. I tried to calm Ernest. I inquired more minutely concerning my father, and here I named my cousin. She, most of all, said Ernest, requires consolation. She accused herself of having caused the death of my brother, and that made her very wretched. But since the murder has been discovered— The murder had discovered? Good God! How can that be? Who could attempt to pursue him? It, it is impossible. One might as well try to overtake the winds, or confine a mountain stream with a straw. I saw him, too. He was free last night." "'I do not know what you mean,' replied my brother, in accents of wonder. "'But to us the discovery we have made completes our misery. No one would believe it at first, and even now Elizabeth will not be convinced, notwithstanding all the evidence. Indeed. Who would credit that Justine Moritz, who was so amiable and fond of all the family, could suddenly become so capable of so frightful, so appalling a crime? Justine Moritz? Poor, poor girl, is she the accused? But it is wrongfully. Every one knows that. No one believes it, surely, Ernest. No one did at first. But several circumstances came out that have almost forced conviction upon us, and her own behaviour has been so confused as 
to add to the evidence of facts a way that i fear leaves no hope for doubt but she will be tried to-day and you will then hear all he then related that the morning on which the murder of poor william had been discovered justine had been taken ill and confined to her bed for several days during this interval one of the servants opening to examine the apparel she had worn on the night of the murder had discovered in her pocket the picture of my mother which had been judged to be the temptation of the murderer the servant instantly showed it to one of the others who without saying a word to any of the family went to a magistrate and upon their disposition justine was apprehended on being charged with the fact the poor girl confirmed the suspicion in a great measure by her extreme confusion of manner this was a strange tale but it did not shake my faith and i replied earnestly you are all mistaken i know the murderer justine poor good justine is innocent at that instant my father entered i saw unhappiness deeply impressed on his countenance but he endeavoured to welcome me cheerfully, and, after we had exchanged our mournful greeting, would have introduced some other topic than that of our disaster, had not Ernest exclaimed, "'Good God, Papa! Victor says that he knows who was the murderer of poor William.' "'We do also, unfortunately,' replied my father. "'For indeed I had rather have been for ever ignorant than have discovered so much depravity and ungratitude in one I valued so highly.' my dear father you are mistaken justine is innocent if she is god forbid that she should suffer as guilty she is to be tried to-day and i hope i sincerely hope that she will be acquitted this speech calmed me i was firmly convinced in my own mind that justine and indeed every human being was guiltless of this murder i had no fear therefore that any circumstantial evidence could be brought forward strong enough to convict her my tale was not one to announce publicly. Its astounding horror would be looked upon as madness by the vulgar. Did any one indeed exist except I, the Creator, who would believe, unless his senses convinced him, in the existence of the living monument of presumption and rash ignorance which I had let loose upon the world? We were soon joined by Elizabeth time had altered her since i last beheld her it had endowed her with loveliness surpassing the beauty of her childish years there was the same candour the same vivacity but it was allied to an expression more full of sensibility and intellect she welcomed me with the greatest affection your arrival my dear cousin said she fills me with hope you perhaps will find some means to justify my poor guiltless Justine. Alas! who is safe if she be convicted of crime? I rely on her innocence as certainly as I do upon my own. Our misfortune is doubly hard to us. We have not only lost that lovely darling boy, but this poor girl, whom I sincerely love, is to be torn away by even a worse fate. If she is condemned I never shall know joy more she will not i am sure she will not and then i shall be happy again even after the sad death of my little william she is innocent my elizabeth said i and that shall be proved fear nothing but let your spirits be cheered by the assurance of her acquittal how kind and generous you are every one else believes in her guilt and that made me wretched for i knew that it was impossible and to see every one else prejudiced in so deadly a manner rendered me hopeless and despairing she wept dearest niece said my father dry your tears if she is as you believe innocent rely on the justice of our laws and the activity with which i shall prevent the slightest shadow of partiality End of section nine.